I'll say a few words uh, just to say. Um, so Sheila started her uh, college career at WPI and then completed a master's at UMass Amherst. After that, she worked for MITRE. Um, here at BU, she has been not just a great individual contributor, is, which is, will be emphasized in this talk, but also a great mentor. She mentored two undergraduate researchers, two undergraduates in the BU Technology Innovation Scholars Program, um, as well as a senior design team. So she's really been very broadly engaged with uh, members of the group and people outside of our research group as well. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Sheila. Um, and before I start, I just want to thank my advisor, Professor Goyal. Like I've learned a lot, but he's also made this a lot of fun. Um, I also want to thank my Draper advisor, Chris Yu, and um, the rest of the committee. Um, thank you guys so much. And I'm very lucky to have like all of my family here. So thank you guys for coming. Um, yeah, so my thesis focuses on um, edge resolved non line of sight imaging. Oops. Um, and non line of sight imaging is just the task of forming an image outside of your line of sight view. Um, and we're interested in this because there's a lot of different applications that could benefit from this capability. This includes autonomous vehicle navigation, whether it's a car or some other kind of vehicle, being able to anticipate something coming up around a barrier could be extremely useful. Um, in search and rescue, you may want to know if someone actually needs help before you send someone into a hazardous situation. And then also in defense, there's um, a lot of situations where you might wanna be able to see around a corner. Um, and so with non-line of sight imaging, we're interested in reconstructing, like I mentioned, this hidden scene that you can't see from your vantage point. And typically the way this is done is um, by collecting light or measurements um, at some surface that's visible both um, to the hidden scene um, and from the viewer's perspective. Um, and a key challenge here um, is that um, light returns to the sensor after multiple diffuse bounces and each bounce is um, scattering light in all directions, um, eliminating directionality information, making it very difficult um, to form a reconstruction of the hidden scene. Um, so existing methods address this challenge in a variety of different ways. There's active systems and these typically um, introduce controlled illumination um, of the hidden scene and then measure what returns to the sensor. And this is often done like now more recently with um, a pulse laser and single photon avalanche diode detectors or SPADs. And these are capable or sensitive to a single photon and able to log um, their arrival times. And so these systems are naturally providing depth information through timing. And here's um, one more famous active non-line of sight imaging system. In this case, they're scanning the laser um, on this grid of scan points that you can see on the relay wall. And in this case, um, they're pointing the SPAD sensor at the same point that's being illuminated. And then like with each um, scan position, you're accumulating this histogram of photon arrival times. And by processing all the scan positions together, you can form a reconstruction of what's going on on the hidden side. One of the challenges um, in these active systems is that they often require these long scan times, and that can make it prohibitively difficult to image objects in motion. And then also there are some systems that parallelize acquisition and can um, reconstruct objects in motion, but they do so using background subtraction. So they can't um, reconstruct stationary hidden scenery, and then the reconstructions of moving objects are poorly resolved. There's also passive techniques. So here we're using light that's already ambient in the scene and also often leveraging occlusion um, that blocks different light paths and helps um, restore some of the directionality information. And so one really famous occluder is the pinhole. Um, so here, um, here's the surface you'd like to recover, but you can only um, view some observation surface out here. And with a pinhole, um, light from a given direction is mapped to a unique location on the observation plane, making it um, pretty easy to recover a 2D view of the hidden scene. Um, and then there's other really creative ways to use occlusion um, to kind of gain back some information and Taralba et al. explored the inverse pinhole. Um, so here in this first measurement frame, light is indiscriminately mapped onto the observation plane. But then at some later frame, some object in green here passes um, between the scene of interest and the observation plane and blocks certain light paths. So if you subtract B from A, you effectively have a pinhole. 
so there's a lot of creative ways um, to use occlusion um, to try to uh, gain some information about the hidden scene. Um, these systems tend to be lower cost because they don't require the same hardware. And they're also stealthy because you're not illuminating the hidden scene. Um, one challenge here is you require the presence of an occluder and sometimes this needs to be estimated or known in advance. Um, and so in this work, I'm gonna focus on the common scenario where the hidden scene is behind a wall with a vertical edge. Um, and this vertical edge gives rise to angular resolution about the hidden scene. Um, so here's a bird's eye view and you can kind of see that the edge is gonna block light as a function of its azimuthal angle. And so if you draw a dotted line between this dot or this point source and the edge, you can see that everything to the right is illuminated by the object and everything to the light is, sorry, to the left is blocked um, by the occluding wall. And the same thing happens uh, with this other object, giving rise to this fan-like penumbra pattern that includes or contains like rich information about um, the hidden scene, particularly azimuthal information. And so if you take pictures of this, um, we can recover that information. Um, so in this thesis, I would like to show that this impediment to line of sight vision itself, this wall with the vertical edge, um, can be exploited um, for enhanced resolution of the hidden scene. And we're actually not um, the first people to explore the utility of the vertical edge for non-line of sight imaging. This was first demonstrated by Bauman et al. <clears throat> and in their work, uh, basically they performed temporal differencing and were able to form <laughs> these 1D reconstructions of objects in motion um, where that 1D is angle around the corner. So here's a picture of their setup. They have a tripod um, in the hidden scene. There's two people walking around and then um, using the measurement acquired here, they're able to form these reconstructions that show motion and angle um, at each column. And then we're looking at how that changes in time. And so you can see um, this is a one person in blue walking around and here's the two person scenario. Um, so in this talk, I'm gonna talk about my four different edge resolved non line of sight imaging projects. Um, the first three are passive projects and the last is a more recent active method. Um, so the first project, we're gonna demonstrate 1D scene estimation from a single passive photograph. And unlike the Bauman work, um, we'll be reconstructing um, stationary hidden scenery. Um, and so we'll also not assume that there's uniform floral beto and that it's not necessarily known. So from a measurement like this, um, I will show you reconstructions that look like this. Um, in the second work, we're really gonna then explore the extent to which you can use the single edge um, to form a 2D plan view reconstruction of the hidden scene. Um, so for a single photograph that looks like this, I'm gonna present to you some 2D plan view reconstructions. Um, and then I'll segue into our doorway camera where um, we're gonna perform even more robust 2D reconstruction um, using the two edges together that occur in a doorway. And so here's some raw measurements that really don't look like anything to the naked eye, but then when you process them, we can reconstruct the objects in motion in this hidden scene um, very robustly. And then the last project is this tracking and active or mapping uh, project with our active corner camera. And so here, uh, this is a line of sight photo of a scene with these two objects moving around. And for each frame, not only are we gonna reconstruct the size and shape and location of those objects, we're also gonna reconstruct um, the background and shadow behind them. And so by accumulating many measurement frames, we'll be able to reconstruct a map of the stationary scenery um, that they occlude as they move through the scene. <clears throat> so before I move on, I just wanna highlight the extent to which the first two projects are similar and different. Um, so they both use one edge and one measured photograph and we're attempting stationary scene reconstruction. And the first one, like I mentioned, we're trying to reconstruct a 1D image of the hidden scene. Um, but a really cool key part of this project is that we're also estimating this unknown floor albedo. Um, but for the second one, we're really focused on understanding the extent to which 2D reconstruction is possible. So here we'll make the problem a little simpler and um, keep the uniform floor albedo. Um, so on to the first project. I just wanna highlight how this is different from the Bauman work where they're performing these 1D reconstructions of objects in motion through background subtraction. In this work, um, we're performing 1D reconstruction of um, stationary scenery using this single photograph. 
and we're not going to assume that there's a uniform floor albedo. Um, and I had the pleasure of working with Yen Ting Ma and John Marie Bruce um, on this project. Um, so for our forward model here, we're gonna write um, the light outgoing at point P on the floor at R comma theta is the sum of all incident light on that point. And we'll parameterize incident light in terms of an azimuthal angle alpha and an elevation angle delta coming out of the slide. And then here, A is the surface albedo um, that we're not gonna assume that we know and we'll try to estimate. Um, and so if you look at the diagram on the left, you can see that there's two sources of incident light. There's light coming from the visible side in green and from the hidden side in blue. So wherever you put your point P um, in the field of view of your camera, the visible side light contribution won't change because we're assuming that light is coming from very far away. What does change is the amount of light um, incident on P from the hidden side um, due to the occlusion of the edge. So you can see here at P, um, we're exposed to light from this darker blue wedge, but the lighter blue wedge is occluded by the edge. So we're gonna define this 1D projection of the hidden scene um, as a function of angle. And as you can see here, we're integrating out over elevation angle delta. And then we can write our forward model in terms of S hidden. Um, and so we're gonna try to estimate this 1D scene as a function of angle. And we'll also attempt to estimate this unknown floor albedo. So this is the forward model that we discussed on the previous slide. We can put together a discrete forward model where Y is the camera measurements, F is the floor albedo, A is this angular operator, integral operator that basically describes the occlusion of the edge. And then V is this 1D projection of the hidden scene. Q describes measurement noise and model mismatch. And so just to give you a sense um, for what this looks like, here's what a measurement might look like on a checkered floor. And here's just the albedo of that floor by itself. And then here's the 1D scene that might give rise um, to this penumbra. And you could imagine this might be like the response of a cylinder or person between 20 and 50 degrees into the hidden scene. And so then in this work, um, we formulate this optimization problem where we have a data fidelity term, and then we're relying heavily on regularizers for the hidden scene and the floor albedo estimate as well. And here are tuning parameters. Um, so we tested this initially on synthetic data where we have access to excellent ground truth. So here's our measurement um, and our estimate of the floor is spot on and does not contain any kind of residual penumbra. And then our scene estimate is so spot on that it sits right on top of the truth. And for this other scenario, here's a different floor, our floor estimate um, and the uh, reconstruction closely matches again. So we also tested this out on data in the lab. So in our setup, we had our occluding wall, this hidden region, which here is 90 degrees, but in practice um, and later in the talk, we'll do full 180 reconstructions. Um, and then we collect our measurement at this region here on the floor. This is what we can see. And the hidden region is um, what's behind the wall since this is a non-line of sight imaging scenario. Um, and so in this observation region, we can put different floor patterns or we can put a white um, floor that we assume known for this easy baseline test. Um, and we also illuminate the hidden scene and uh, we have a light source also to introduce ambient light on the visible side and the camera is mounted on that same tripod. Um, so yeah, and then in the hidden region, we can kind of switch out different um, scenes for testing. And I'll show you kind of what that looks like on this example here. Um, so here's a line of sight view of a um, test scene. And when we have that white floor for kind of like our baseline test, we form these three reconstructions in the three different color channels. And then when you put them together in this RGB image, um, you can see we get this really close match um, between our estimate and the hidden scene. And then when we introduce this pattern floor and try to estimate that, in addition to um, the hidden scene, um, it's a little more fuzzy, but still very spot on. Um, and so we also wanted to demonstrate that this works with high levels of ambient light. And so I'll do that using this simple test case here. Um, and so the easiest case um, for the cylinder is like a white floor with very high per number to ambient light ratio. And here's our very crisp reconstruction. You can see, I think we're even reconstructing like the um, specular part of the cylinder. 
And then when we add in our pattern four and more and more ambient light to the point where you can't even kind of see the penumbra with the naked eye, um, we're still able to pick out the cylinder, although there are some artifacts in those more challenging cases. Um, so to recap here, we've demonstrated 1D reconstruction of stationary hidden scenery, um, not assuming uniform floor albedo and using just one edge and um, one photograph. Um, so now I'm gonna discuss 2D reconstruction from a single edge. Um, so in the last project, we had assumed that all light is in the far field and we saw a 1D reconstruction of the hidden scene. And in this work, we're gonna explore the extent to which 2D plan view um, reconstruction is possible. And again, here I worked with our former postdocs, John Murray Bruce um, and Yanting Ma. Um, so before we really dive in, I wanna show you our point target analysis where we were kind of trying to qualitatively understand um, the merit and challenge of um, 2D plan view reconstruction using just one vertical edge. And so our approach here was to derive the Kramer Rao bound for localizing a point target um, at a range rho s and an angle phi s in the hidden scene at a height of zero. Um, and so I'll show you just some sample results here <laughs> from a simple scenario. And we'll be comparing to the no edge case to understand kind of the gain we get from putting in the edge occluder. And so here's a bird's eye view with no edge in this yellow point target. Um, it's at a range rho in this azimuthal angle alpha. And then if we take a photograph on the floor here, it looks something like this, where you can see there's like these subtle radial fall off patterns in the measurement. And then if we use our Kramer Rao bound tools to plot um, uncertainty regions around this point and other points on a um, polar grid, they look like this, which isn't really surprising as expected. Um, there's more uncertainty further from the measurement. Um, but if we put our edge occluder in place and plot, I guess the uh, measurement here now has um, this penumbra pattern in it um, at that yellow point target location. And here's the um, uncertainty regions with the edge in place. And so although these are bubbles, they look like lines just because um, the angular uncertainty is so small due to the vertical edge occluder. Um, and another interesting trend that I'll point out is that um, deeper into the hidden scene, the uncertainty in range is actually larger um, with the edge in place. And that's because um, we're really relying on radial fall off patterns and the illuminated pixels um, to discern range. And as you can see here, a lot of the measurement pixels are in shadow um, in this case. Um, so you might've seen those results and been wondering why are we trying to estimate range if that information is so much weaker? Um, and so I'm gonna try to demonstrate that here. Um, so here's a photograph of a hidden scene we have our occluding wall um, and then just this one <coughs> hidden cylinder. And we can take a measurement here, just this really high penumbra to ambient light measurement. And if we assume that all light is in the far field, like we did in our first project, here's what our 1D reconstruction looks like, where yes, you can see that we're resolving this target at the right angular extent, but um, at angles where there clearly is no object, there's artifacts. Um, and then if you look at the residual, um, there's a lot of undescribed radial fall off um, in our measurement. So if we incorporate range or radial fall off into our forward model and attempt to estimate range, we end up ultimately getting this 1D reconstruction, which is much crisper, much fewer artifacts and a much smaller residual. So we're adding a useful reconstruction dimension and improving our forward model and our estimate of the 1D scene as well. Um, so here in setting up our forward model, we use those same cylindrical coordinates. Um, and then for the visible side, we use the same polar coordinates from before. And we're gonna write again, the outgoing light um, at point P is the sum of incident light from the visible side and incident light from the hidden side. And here we're multiplying by albedo, but in this project, we assume that it's uniform. Um, and so LH is the sum of all light coming from the hidden scene. And in this case, it's attenuated by radial fall off. And you can see the D squared and the denominator here. Um, D is the distance along the floor um, between point P and the scene element at rho comma alpha. And SH bar is this 2D plan view that we seek to recover. Um, so we can further model occlusion and make this problem more tractable by assuming that SH bar is separable in range and angle. Um, and so we can write it in this way. 
where this is the Dirac impulse function. And so SH alpha, again, is that 1D um, profile of intensity is a function of angle. And to remind you what that looks like for an object between angle gamma and beta, we'll just see this kind of like profile peak at that angle. And then rho H alpha is the scene range is a function of angle. And so at most, um, now we're estimating a single range and intensity for angle. Um, so now we have our continuous board model written in terms of the light from the hidden side and the 2D plan view that we seek to recover. Um, we can put together a discrete board model. And in addition to writing SH bar is separable in range and angle, we're further gonna make this problem easier for ourselves by um, assuming that there's only Q objects in the hidden scene. So we're gonna estimate just Q ranges and Q angular extents. And we'll still estimate a really high resolution um, scene profile as a function of angle. So in this scenario, there's two targets, Q equals two, just estimating two ranges, two angular extents, but we'll still be after this really high resolution um, reconstruction and angle kind of inspired by our CRB findings. Um, so our objective function has this data fidelity term, um, a term to promote sparsity of the scene in a wavelet basis. And then we're also constraining our range and scene estimates be positive. And we solve this using an alternating method. Um, so here's one scene and measurement and our corresponding reconstruction. And I'll just call your attention to the fact that we have like really crisp boundaries between the different colors, um, which kind of reflects our high angular resolution. And we also place them correctly with respect to each other in range. But if you do look at these um, kind of like tick labels, you can see that um, we do have some error in the range estimates. Um, so we recognize that these results have been tested in like a very control controlled lab environment. Um, and so we were really interested in understanding the extent to which this works with more ambient light and model mismatch. So here is a scene that we tested this on and a very high and penumbra to ambient light ratio result. And then as you add more ambient light, you can see that although our angular kind of estimate remains spot on, the um, range estimate does start to degrade. And this just reflects the fact that range is fundamentally harder to estimate um, and it's just challenging. Um, so to recap here, I've shown 2D reconstruction um, from a single photograph with just one edge. And we found that although it's possible in a really controlled lab environment, um, that it's also not robust um, to um, low SNR and model mismatch. Which brings me to our third project here, this doorway camera, where we're using two edges together um, for much more robust 2D reconstructions. Um, so again, the idea of using two edges together um, was actually initially um, proposed in the original Bauman corner camera work. And so here you can see um, in their setup, they have this camera looking at the floor in the doorway and they have a single person walking around in the hidden scene. And then here are the two reconstructions formed one at each edge. And if you just recall, this shows motion and angle um, in time. And then to use the two edges together, they manually trace these contours through um, to find the location of the object and angle in time, and then use those together to triangulate these tracks in 2D of where this object has moved. And this is really great, um, but it doesn't scale up naturally to more than one object. Um, so for example, here with two objects, if each edge only provides um, azimuthal information, the left edge will kind of isolate scene content at these wedges. <clears throat> and then the right edge will isolate scene content at these wedges. And you can see um, that although they do overlap at the true object locations, um, there's also these locations where there's these phantom objects and her method cannot choose between these. Um, so in summary, triangulating the position of multiple hidden objects is just um, not possible without ambiguity um, with just as data. Um, so like Bauman, um, in this work, we're gonna use background reconstruction um, to reconstruct, hit, or, sorry, background subtraction to reconstruct stationary moving hidden scenery. Um, uh, but unlike them, in our approach, we're going to take this measurement of both at both edges and we'll process those jointly and together to produce two different reconstruction views of the hidden scene. 
Um, and we'll show you our algorithm working on different synthetic and experimental um, scenarios. And here I have the pleasure of working with Will Kriska um, on this project. Um, so as you already know, um, hopefully from the earlier parts of this talk, each edge primarily provides azimuthal information measured around that edge. And so um, for this point target location, um, the left edge is gonna tell you alpha one and the right edge will tell you alpha two. And it turns out like these two angles can describe most points in this 2D plane. And that's called the biangular coordinate system. And inspired by the angular resolving power of each edge um, in this work, we work with the biangular coordinate system. Um, and then also we do incorporate radial fall off information into our forward model. And this is what allows us to choose between the true object locations and the phantom ones that I showed you a few slides back. So in this work, um, we also did a similar point target analysis. Um, and our goal again is to kind of try to qualitatively understand the gain of the second edge for 2D reconstruction. Um, and this time again, we're deriving the claim route bound for localizing the point target, but now we're localizing it in um, biangular coordinates. So it's at angle phi one and phi two. Um, and I'm gonna compare to the case that we're all more familiar with already, the one edge scenario. So here um, there's that one edge and I'm showing uncertainty at different points on a biangular grid. And here's a sample measurement for this red point on the grid. And as we've seen before, we're just observing very high range uncertainty, but um, very low angular uncertainty, which is why these kind of look like lines. <laughs> um, so in the doorway case, we can plot um, our uncertainty regions, and now they look like dots. Um, and here's the two measurements from that uh, red dot in the, in the grid. But yeah, we're seeing that the doorway occluder greatly reduces um, our positional uncertainty, um, compared to the single edge case. And yeah, although these do kind of vary spatially, um, it's hard to see that in this plot just because the uncertainty is generally so small. Um, so when we put together our discrete forward model, we work with the biangular grid. And so uh, we start by dividing the space into these equiangular wedges at the left edge. And we do the same at the right edge to form the grid. And then you can take a grid cell um, and what we end up doing is connecting across two vertices to form the footprint of a vertical rectangular facet on our um, reconstruction grid. And here's what our um, set of facet footprints looks like um, when we use our actual reconstruction grid. Um, and so for each facet in our reconstruction algorithm, um, at the ith facet, we're gonna estimate um, one color triplet kind of inspired by the fact that we think both edges should observe the same color. Um, but we will allow both edges to observe different intensities. And so we're estimating CL and CR, these two um, intensity multipliers. And so that kind of yields our two reconstruction views. So the left view is CL times the color triplet and the right view is CR times the color triplet. And if you look at this plot on the right, we've kind of um, color coded the facet footprints in um, two different colors. So the red facets are foreground facets, um, which we constrain to have positive contributions um, to our difference measurement. Um, and that's because we think there's objects moving, introducing new light. Um, and then in the far field, this outer ring of facets, we allow those to be both positive or negative to kind of describe the effects of occlusion on the background. So the moving objects in the foreground could block the background and cause a negative change in the measured light. Um, so we can write our background subtracted measurement in the piece color channel as this concatenated measurement of the left and the right um, corner measurements. And this first term is the change in ambient light between frames. And then the second part is the penumbra um, where here I'm highlighting the left and right reconstruction views. And we're multiplying by our light transport model which describes the radial fall off and the occlusion of the edge and Q is noise and model mismatch. Um, so to form our reconstruction, we're minimizing this cost function. And again, we're estimating these five unknowns per facet um, in our grid. And we're also estimating the change in ambient light between frames. Um, we have our data fidelity term. The summation is over the three different color channels. Um, and then a term to promote group sparsity. 
And so here each group is um, the intensity multipliers at a given facet. And the idea behind this is that in general, if there's an object present, both edges will either see it or will see it. And if nothing's present, um, neither of them will see it. Um, but this does allow us for them to have to observe different intensities. Um, so in our paper, we came up just with some simple logic to kind of combine the two reconstruction views into um, one view. Um, and it just kind of shows you where the two views agree. And some of the results that I show will present this type of um, result. Um, so I'm going to start with a synthetic example to kind of demonstrate to you how our method works. And we use the Blender rendering tool to create data, which is great um, both to avoid inverse crime, but also it gives you excellent line of sight truth data. Um, so here um, is a line of sight photograph of the stationary hidden scene um, from the perspective of the left um, and right edges. And then when our objects have entered or moving objects have moved into the hidden scene, this um, red and blue target, um, this is what the scene looks like. And then you can subtract the stationary scene from the new frame to look at change. And so here's that positive part of that change. It's just the light added from those objects. And here's the negative part. And this is due to those objects blocking light from the scene behind them. Um, and so here's what like a raw measurement frame looks like. After subtracting um, our background or stationary scene measurement, you can see the penumbra more clearly. And this is what we feed into our algorithm. And then in our reconstructions, Here's the positive part of the left and right views. And you can kind of compare them to this bird's eye view photograph of the scene. And then here's the negative parts um, and the unified reconstruction view. And I guess I'll just point out that um, the left and right views are different in a meaningful way. So uh, this left view sees um, more of the red, more light from the red target, as you can definitely see looking at this line of sight view, and that's reflected in the reconstruction. Um, so I'm also now going to show you some synthetic results um, for a scenario that would be very challenging for the Bauman method. So here we have three objects of the same color and um, the measurements. And our result um, clearly resolves all three of these objects in the right locations. Um, and so we also wanted to demonstrate that this works um, with real data in the lab. So here is our kind of hidden scene setup. And in this case, we have three different objects um, or mannequins. And then we take these raw photographs in the, in the um, doorway. And once you crop out the left and right measurement regions, the measurements look like this. And then our unified reconstruction um, clearly picks out the three objects. And we may even be seeing kind of the head of this larger, um, brighter mannequin in the center. Um, so, all of these results I showed you were for 64 by 64 pixel measurements. Um, and so we were curious to see, does this work with much smaller measurement regions, which is great because it would mean the algorithm could also run much faster. And we were really pleased to see that all the way down to eight by eight, um, the reconstruction really looks um, completely the same. Um, and we also added more noise. Um, and here, although there is a little bit of degradation or maybe an artifact here, um, it still works quite well. <clears throat> so to recap, um, here I've shown a much more robust 2D, um, two view recovery of the hidden scenery in motion um, using the doorway occluder. And so now I'm gonna talk about our um, active corner camera. So before I dive in, I wanna talk about um, some important relevant prior work. And so this is the Edge Resolve Transient Imaging System, or ERTI, uh, that was proposed by some of my lab mates. Um, and so here, basically, they are using the vertical edge um, to help reconstruct the hidden scene. And they do this by scanning this pulse laser in a very small arc um, around the edge. And here's a single pixel um, spad pointed at this like pink point on the ground. Um, and so as you kind of move the laser around this arc, more and more of the hidden scene is illuminated. Um, so here's a future scan position. And then by differencing the measured histograms, they can kind of isolate light um, from small wedges in the hidden scene. And by processing all these histograms together, um, they form these really cool reconstructions of the hidden scene. Um, and so even though in this work, they were able to use the edge to really reduce the scan time, it's still too long um, to image objects in motion. Um, another work, 
that is relevant here um, because they use a lot of the same hardware that um, we'll use in the system I'm about to propose is by Gurupi et al. And so here um, they're pointing the SPAD array at the floor. And so this is a SPAD camera with 32 by 32 pixels. Um, and if you notice it's um, field of view is pushed up in front of the wall so that um, none or very few of the pixels are occluded by the wall. And then this laser is pulsed on the floor at a fixed position to illuminate the hidden scene. Um, and then they perform background subtraction and seek reconstructions of an object in motion in the hidden scene. And so they're assuming they know the height and then forming these very coarse reconstructions in this scaled down setup. Um, and so kind of to summarize here, um, like other system, active systems that image objects in motion, um, not only is it incapable of reconstructing stationary scenery because of the background subtraction, it's also um, producing these poorly resolved reconstructions of an object in motion. Um, so in this work, um, we propose and demonstrate this new non-line of sight um, imaging system to reconstruct both the size and shape of um, objects in motion. And we're also gonna simultaneously um, map the stationary hidden scenery that they occlude as they move through the scene. And I work closely with Hoover Rueda Chikan on this project. <clears throat> um, so in our system, um, we're pointing our SPAD array um, at the floor like Gareppi et al, but unlike in their work, we're putting it right next to this edge to really exploit um, the occlusion provided by the vertical edge. And also like in their work, um, we're pulsing this laser at the floor in a fixed position to illuminate um, the entire hidden scene. Um, and our goal is to reconstruct the hidden scene using change between subsequent measurement frames. <clears throat> So here's a view, a side view of the scene. Um, and we can write our measurement likelihood um, for the measurement X at the nth spatial pixel in the kth time bin is Poisson distributed with these rates. And so here B is the background rates due to the stationary parts of the hidden scene. And we're gonna assume that this can be well characterized um, by some initial measurement acquired before anything kind of enters and moves through the scene. And then you can imagine this object with parameters psi fg enters the scene. Now we have added counts due to the presence of that object. Um, but even cooler, it's actually blocking um, light from this region in shadow behind it with parameters psi occluded. And so we're going to have this rate reduction due to this shadow. And so um, our goal is to reconstruct for each measurement frame the parameters that describe the foreground and the parameters that describe the region and shadow um, behind it. And so what this will look like is this object will move through the hidden scene and we'll fit it with a facet and also describe the background behind it with the facet as well. And so as we accumulate frames, we're not only tracking and describing this foreground object, but mapping the scenery behind it. So we're seeking this facet-based reconstruction of changes um, in the hidden scene um, for each measurement frame. And my reconstruction algorithm relies heavily on a quick computation of the Ford model. Um, so I derived this um, kind of like approximate computation that's a lot faster for the response of a facet um, in the hidden scene. And so this really messy expression here is just um, the rates due to a facet at the nth spatial pixel and the kth time bin. Um, and so if you look at the um, plot below, I'm showing the laser spot PL and this point in the pixel on the floor PF. And then PS is a point on the facet. And then in this expression, we're integrating over the pixel area and over the um, time extent of the time bin. And then also over the area of the facet. I is laser intensity. We're multiplying by the albedo of the facet. We have four shortening terms. And then this delayed pulse waveform that we're gonna approximate as an impulse. Um, so if you look here, um, PL and PF form the foci of ellipsoids that contain points with equal round trip travel time from this laser spot out to the scene and then back to PF. Um, and so if you consider the ellipsoid formed by like the beginning of the time bin, the intersection of that ellipsoid with this plane is going to be an ellipse and I'm showing the segment of that ellipse here in red. And then for the end of the time bin, we'll have a slightly larger ellipsoid and that intersection is shown here in blue. And so the shaded region um, in between these two curves is the part of this facet that contributes to your measured rates um, at the nth spatial pixel 
um, and the kth time bin. Um, so we're interested in a quick computation so we can kind of approximate the expression on top by evaluating the integrand um, at the center of this pixel at PF bar and at the center of this annulus at PS bar. Um, and we're multiplying by the area of the pixel and the area of delta arc, um, which initially wasn't obvious how to compute that area in an approximate and quick way. Um, but I found this really cool uh, paper where they basically show you how to find um, this new coordinate system where you can write the intersection of an ellipsoid and a plane as an ellipse in translational form. So to show you just what that looks like, here's our new coordinate system RS. And now we're looking straight down um, at our ellipse um, in the way that we're used to looking at an ellipse, you can write it in a form you're familiar with. And then it was pretty straightforward um, to come up with an approximation for delta arc. Um, and so in the end, this computation was 150 times faster and very closely matched um, the like more conventional and slow numerical integration technique. Um, so for our inversion algorithm, our first step, um, we apply our passive 1D corner camera techniques um, to initialize the angular locations in the scene where motion is occurring. And then we um, estimate the parameters um, for the foreground and background facets. Um, so we're estimating the angular extent, the range, the albedo, the height. Um, and then for the background, we're estimating the range and the albedo. And then it's cool as we accumulate frames, we have these shadowed background patches that we can kind of connect to form the maps that I'm gonna show you um, when I present the results on the next slide. Um, so here's a fun scenario that we tested. We have two objects moving through the hidden scene on like fixed radius arcs. And you can take like one measurement frame and integrate it temporally to see the passive measurement. Um, and here you see that penumbra that we're so familiar with now, these two shadows. And you can integrate spatially over all of the pixels to see a profile kind of of this measurement um, in range. And so in this plot, I'm showing our reference measurement, which was acquired before any motion in the hidden scene. And then the blue curve shows our new frame measurement and the difference is below them. And so I'll call your attention to this peak here, which is the added counts due to the um, introduction of these objects. And then this dip here, which is due to the shadow cast on the walls behind them. And so um, here's some of our single frame reconstruction results from the eight different uh, selection from our eight different frames. And yeah, you can see that we can resolve these objects um, with very accurate height, range, and pretty accurate angular extent as well. Um, and we're finding the shadowed region behind them. In this middle case, one of the objects is passing in front of the other, so we only resolve one, but we get the range very spot on and the height as well, and are still able to find the background. And so then when we accumulate um, the eight total frames together, um, this is the map of the background, and it sits right on top of the ground truth here, which was very exciting. Um, so we do use this rectangular facet model. And so we wanted to see that this still works um, with stuff that doesn't fit our model. And so we tested out um, with a mannequin, like the one seen here in the staircase. And you can see that although um, our algorithm doesn't allow us to kind of describe the finer features of the mannequin, um, we still get its height and location and can still find the shadow region behind it. And the same is true um, for the staircase. Um, so yeah, we also were curious how well this works when we turn on the light in the lab or have a very high <laughs> ambient um, light amount. So um, we turn on the lights and here's what the stationary scene looks like with the lights on in the lab. And then once the object has entered in the new measurement frame, it looks like this. <clears throat> and then here you can see um, our reference and new frame measurements integrated um, spatially. and they just look really similar here because they're both dominated by um, background counts. But if you take the difference um, here, you can see that although it's very noisy, we have the peak due to the object in this um, shadowed region. Um, and our reconstruction fortunately is still able to kind of resolve the target and find the shadowed region behind it. Um, although this did take a longer integration time. Um, so to recap, here we've demonstrated an active non-line-of-sight imaging system that can reconstruct the size 
um, and position of objects and also kind of reconstruct a map of the stationary hidden scenery behind them. Um, and so, yeah, in this talk, I hope um, that I've used these four projects to demonstrate um, that the impediment to line of sight vision itself, this wall with a vertical edge can be useful um, to enhance your resolution of the hidden scene. <laughs> it's really fun to think about um, future research directions here. So um, one of them that could be applied to a couple of these different projects is to process um, subsequent frames together and kind of leverage the correlations between subsequent frames to form better reconstructions. Um, and then it's cool to think that, you know, if you look around you, there's like not just vertical edges, but like the top of a door frame um, and there's just edges everywhere. So if you could automatically find them and use them together, um, you could do really interesting things. Like we got a lot of gain from that one additional edge um, in the doorway. It's fun to think about what could be achieved with like more edges. Um, yeah, and then we can also think about what steps we might need to take to make this more operational. And so in this thesis, um, we proposed a lot of um, kramer bound tools that might be useful in kind of optimizing um, the system's parameters, like what's the best field of view or um, where should we be pointing the laser in the last case for kind of optimal performance. And then some engineering tasks like modeling and estimating the wall thickness. And if we're on a mobile platform, um, we would probably need to incorporate viewing angle um, into the model. Um, so in this work, I've discussed the four projects and they're documented in these papers, but I've also been really lucky um, to get to mentor Louisa Watkins, who's an undergrad working in particle beam microscopy. So here's our works um, in that area. And so yeah, happy to take any questions. Yeah. I was curious if the width of the doorway plays a role at all in how good the reflections are in the early classes. Yeah, that's a really good question. It definitely plays a role, which is why in some of these uh, we're only showing 90 degrees reconstruction, because once you pass that 90 degrees, you probably need to model that um, if it's um, if it's like a substantial width. Um, so I think it's like, it can be estimated and um, it's easily incorporated into the model, but um, we weren't always interested in taking on that more engineering task. I think yeah. there might have been, there's width and thickness. Width and thickness. Are you referring to the width or the Wait, what are, how are they different? Like, width of the door oh, the I see. Like that, like that's a wider door. Oh, okay. I think like with the biangular grid, like the size of the um, grid cells that are formed kind of reflects your uncertainty. And the grid would definitely look different um, with different cells having different shapes um, depending on the width of the doorway. So you're right. I think like, um, I guess we can't choose our doorways, but there may be optimal doorways for seeing certain parts of the hidden scene. Yeah. So Sheila, if you can repeat the question for, for explain the question from the audience. Oh yeah, with this one. So actually I was asking if the width of the doorway um, has an effect and it's a great question because it probably does. Um, it, effect, it does probably un affect the uncertainty that you have at certain parts of the scene. Do you want to speak to your question, Josh? Sure. Uh, really great work, Sheila. I think especially the ellipse approximation thing at the end seems like it was really tricky and also super helpful. So I, I know that <laughs> I had avoided doing that and just assumed spheres, which are much easier. So props on actually tackling the ellipsoids. Um, I, I, I love this this latest work. I was curious if you had like a mobile or something hanging over the SPAD array field of view, could you also do like a volumetric reconstruction? Like you're collecting so much information on all those SPAD array pixels. And if you had something sort of floating above that, 
could you could you get something like you've got all this you've got these facets that are in the hidden scene but then something that's also like hanging on top could you capture that as well with some of the more i don't know traditional non-line of sight imaging techniques Sorry, you're you're muted, so I can't hear you. I just want to oh. <laughs> just to just to clarify, Josh. Um, do you mean like can we reconstruct facets that like aren't necessarily resting on the floor? I guess I mean, in addition to what you have on the floor, um, like the volumetric reconstruction techniques, where you where you usually scan a bunch of points on a wall and then reconstruct a full 3D volume, you sort of have the complement where you're, you have a single laser point and then an array detector on the floor. And so it's sort of perfectly looking upwards. So I, I just wonder if you had something hanging like a chandelier or a, a mobile, which was something that was really throwing us off in some of the earlier work, but um, you, you might actually be able to reconstruct it. I was just curious if you That's had thought question. of <laughs> that sort of thing. No, I didn't think of that, <laughs> but it's a really good question. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, maybe you should be able to um, like do even more high resolution reconstruction. It doesn't take advantage of your occluder though. So I, I understand why it wasn't <laughs> the focus of your work. It's a great question um, though. Thanks. So please feel free to ask any sort of questions. You will be dismissed for a predicting later. So feel free to really ask. So the question is, say is like if the floor has like a, it's entirely red. How much harder is it to capture like a red object? So like there's like the color matters. Um, I guess like it could be more reflective in the red channel, which might like as long as it's Lambertian might make it easier because you would have like a higher like signal rate. Um, but it's more like I think what was challenging for us was if it was like spatially varying. Um, yeah. Oh, she was asking um, basically like um, how challenging would it be if like the floor had different colors or like was more reflective in the red channel than the others? Just like if you have an object uh, that's the same color as the floor. Um, maybe about the same. I can't think of why um, that wouldn't be harder. I guess like if like if the floor is like less reflective to a certain wavelength, that would be challenging. So, thank you. Actually, let me all follow, follow up. Are you able to get absolute? Like, are is is every in the first project? Are these all kind of up to a scale factor types of reconstructions, or do you have reconstructions that you could put like units on? No units. Yeah. Oh, I guess that you're saying like, would the channels kind of need to be like normalized to each other when we get our output? Like that might be like to kind of account for the floor's effect. Um, so this is a chance for like a general question that I always have for non-line of fire imaging. What if you change um, the, the wavelength of the, of the channels? So for example, what if you use um, radio frequency uh, ways uh, instead of visible light to, 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 to do the same thing. Yeah, I. Um, well, what, what would that happen? Like, will, will it make the problem easier? Or, um, yeah, so how, how would that change this? 
so the question was, um, what if we have different frequencies of light, like radio frequencies? Um, I don't know enough about how um, like RF reflects off of the ground, I guess to give like a good answer, but like I would definitely check that all of the assumptions in the model kind of match um, the new frequency. I guess I'm not enough of an expert to know like if like is the floor still Lambertian? Um, not, yeah, but yeah, you would have to consider like if the model still matches. Yeah. I have a goofy question. So <laughs> operationally, if you had a door on your opening, did you could you figure out where to position your door so that if you you could optimize portions of the room that you were observing? Um, yeah, I think the, tell me if this is wrong. I think the question was like, can you move the door? Uh, if you could move the door, like, would there be a best? Door in the opening, like, uh, in door. Oh. You have an opening, right? But if you have a door, now you don't have to move your, you have a way to manipulate. Yeah, I, I want to try to go to the slide. Um, like this, the, these grits, since these are like equiangular wedges, they kind of like where they intersect in these grid cells, I think kind of does reflect your uncertainty, um, like wherever the grid cell is located. Um, so I think if you're asking like if the door is open, maybe this other dot is over here. Like one challenging part of the scene is like at these deeper angles around the, the edge. And so if you're interested in something here, maybe like opening a door here would really help um, form reconstructions over there to kind of like, yeah, okay. I think that's true. Yeah, sort of yeah. yeah, I think, yeah. Okay. If I was gonna give you like a really rigorous answer, I would maybe kind of like create this grid cell at the, like at different angles and kind of look at where the cells are smaller. Yeah. yeah. Were you thinking that by putting a door in there and you swing the door to some position, then the doorway opening is now different? So that the doorway opening really is now based is. on where the Oh, but then. Do you want a sliding door? Oh, a sliding door. Wait, now I, I feel like. Sliding door. Sliding door. Sliding door. Sliding door. Sliding door. Sliding door. <laughs> Wait, now I'm not sure about my answer. I have to think about it more because, like, it's not really like the same kind of edge. Like if it's like open like that, so it's like a, that's a really interesting question, and I would need to like put a little more thought into like, like maybe it's not as easy as just rotating this grid, um, but it's a really cool question. Yeah. Okay. 